Use 10 degree down bubble. Submerge the ship. Make my depth 150 feet. 10 degree down bubble, aye, sir. Chief of the watch. Submerge the ship. Submerge the ship, aye, sir. All vents are open, sir. Die. Die. Straight board, sir. Very well. Submarines have a long and storied history in the United States, but they aren't more important anywhere than they are here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where they've been building and repairing subs for a long time. This is the albacore. It has a history intertwined with the thresher. Around here, submarines are a way of life. When the Navy wanted the newest, fastest, deepest diving boat they could get, they came to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. But back then, it looked a little different. The Portsmouth Naval Shipyard is located on CV Island across the Piscataqua River from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Its history harkens back to the beginning of our country. During World War II, the shipyard launched four submarines in one day, a record that still stands. To counter the Soviet threat during the Cold War, the United States developed a strategy which called for a new class of hunter-killer submarines. It was here, at the shipyard, that the USS Thresher was designed and built. This is her birthplace, and this would be her home. Well, the hull shape, which was pioneered with the albacore, was that shape which was developed in wind tunnel tests and everything which would travel totally submerged through the water with the least resistance. On the surface, her speed was only about half of what it was submerged because on the surface it was a terrible shape hull. And with the advent of nuclear power, of course, you didn't have to spend much time on the surface. When the boat would leave the shipyard to go somewhere, they'd go out, as soon as they got to deep water, they submerged stay submerged on their way to whatever their destination was. The pressure was designed to be very quiet. All her machinery was sound mounted. In fact, on uh, one of our sea trials that I went out on, I was underneath the main propulsion plant and the whole thing was mounted on a platform and the platform was sound mounted to the hull. And I was underneath it with a dial indicator and they wanted to see how much the platform would move as the boat did steep down and up angles. And I can remember being down underneath there and the, the little 
needle on the gauge would spin around as the whole thing would move forward or aft, which was quite interesting. The thresher, of course, also was uh, very deep diving. Her test depth is still classified, but it's interesting to note that every time a submarine class was designed to go deeper, it was first done at Portsmouth. During the war, the fleet boats were changed from a 300-foot test depth to 400 feet with the advent of high tensile steel. And then after the war, we went from the 400 feet down to 700-foot test depth. And then after the 700 feet, we went down to Thresher's test depth, which was much, much greater than that. Now, Another point to me to be made, Alba Corps was built in the mid fifties. So we did a lot of the trials that went into the makings of the nuclear boats, Thresher and so forth. Right. We did a lot of the high speed tests. Now the old fleet boats, wide open, they'd only do seven knots mm -hmm. and then discharge the body the batteries and you'd have to go to the service. But Alba get caught for their 19 years, all they did was test something. So in the mid-50, we started testing, and then you get, you get the thresher in the, in the 60s. So it kind of incorporated into a, a lot of stuff from Albuco went to these nuclear boats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the torpedo tubes were moved aft, and they were angled out 10 degrees from the center line of the boat, two tubes on each side. Mm -hmm. They had to move them aft to make room for the sonar sphere, which was took up the entire bow. And uh, it's interesting, the sonar sphere contained 1,200 and some transducers. You could almost boil the water when they had them activated. The torpedo tube, 10 degrees, worked out very nicely. A lot of testing went into this. As a matter of fact, they brought a fleet oil or tanker into the shipyard and installed one torpedo tube at a 10 degree angle just to try things out. In fact, I went with the tanker down to Newport, Rhode Island on Narragansett Bay and they fired different kinds of torpedoes because we had quite an assortment of torpedoes, both those that were ejected and those that swam out by themselves. And everything worked fine. It was the Soviet submarine navy that we were really concerned about, and that was what the Thresher was designed to, to counter. That building is where the Thresher was built. It was launched bow first to protect the sonar dome. This was the first time a submarine had been launched this way. If you look really hard, you can almost see it.
In April of 1961, after spending nine months being fitted out for sea trials, she was deemed ready. Guests during these trials would include Vice Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, head of the Navy's nuclear propulsion program. The shallow dive tests went well, but within days, instrumental problems cut the testing of her deep dive short. And all this time, the submarine rescue ship Skylark was standing by. The Thresher was returned to port, brought back to the shipyard for repairs. It wouldn't be long before the ship was once again ready to go. The USS Thresher was commissioned on August 3, 1961, to become the newest member of the Atlantic Submarine Fleet. The Navy threw at her everything they had during the course of the next year to ensure her success. She would spend time basking in the seas of the Bahamas and Puerto Rico as she was put through her paces. Connecticut was her weapons base as she was outfitted for torpedoes. And the coast along Massachusetts and Connecticut was her test field for war games. When the ship and crew finally got a reprieve, they would return to Portsmouth and the familiar ground of home. As the months passed, testing continued up and down the coastline again and again, test after test. It became extremely clear the Thresher was a thoroughbred. She could take anything a test could dish out and stand strong. The next step was a trip to Fort Lauderdale to test her fit for subrock missiles. The subrock was, was a, uh, a rocket uh, with a nuclear warhead. Mm -hmm. And it was designed to uh, fire into what they call the second or third convergence zone. Uh, what happens with sound in the water is that some sound will uh, some sound will kind of undulate and uh, it will focus. Uh, I think 30, 30 miles is the first convergence zone. Sixty miles is the second. Uh, if you're deep enough, you can uh, you can find those things and track things. Uh, which was what the uh, uh, Thresher's sonar system was designed to do. And then you could shoot this, um, this <laughs> humongous rocket, uh, which would uh, float up to the surface and then ignite and zoom off. And uh, um, it was not something that you could shoot at short range because you would probably sink yourself. The assessment of the ship clocked in at a year, testing not only the submarine, but her crew as well. The combination was vital and required that they work together like a well-oiled machine. Commander Dean L. Axine, a 1944 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, put his men through the paces. She was as fast as they had dreamed. She was the most modern, high-tech submarine in the world. She ran silent. She ran deep. The Navy was proud of her. They were handing out awards and medals to just about anybody connected to her creation. Soon, it was time to head up the coast for home. Home was officially New Groton, Connecticut, but to the skipper and crew, home was Portsmouth. 
Commander Axine requested they return there as that's where their families were. That was their port. That's where their final overhaul would take place. That's also where they would receive their new skipper. Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey would replace Commander Axine at the helm. The Thrusher would undergo a nine-month tune-up. For the Navy, that meant attention to every detail. She would be stripped and checked and rechecked. She would be tweaked and tuned and rebuilt till she was like new. The Thrusher would be cut open to access equipment, which would be repaired or replaced. The Portsmouth Navy Yard engineers lovingly known as Yardbirds were used to this process. They'd done it many times before. From late summer of 1962 to spring of 1963, the ship and her crew once again would be dockside on the Piscataqua. My brother-in-law was apprehensive about going out on that trial. Mm -hmm. He, uh, we went, as I, as I mentioned before, we were very close and we knew he was going on, <coughs> excuse me, on the trial. So we went, my little family, my husband, myself, and my two boys went to visit the Sunday before. And uh, he, he mentioned that he didn't think the ship was ready to go. Hmm. So, I, I, and I, I think he was not the only one that felt that way, from what I've heard. Yeah. My mother did. She had a premonition the night before. Really? She told him, Phil, if you go, you're never coming back. Really? Mm -hmm. And she'd never had anything like that before. She was very uneasy she about him. She sat down at gate two, watched him walk across the bridge, and she said, well, I'll never see him again. And she'd never had that thought like that on any other sea trials. April 9th, 1963, the beginning of the end. Long before dawn's first gray light, the crew of the Thresher would begin the process of nuclear fission. It would be mid-morning before the ship would slip away from the dock and head on down the river toward open sea. Only a select few, those standing in the sail, would enjoy the familiar sights the Portsmouth Naval Prison, nicknamed the Castle. Fort McClary in Kittery Point. Fort Point Lighthouse. Whaleback. and K2R. The crew, encased in her hull, would not see the Isles of Shoals slipping past as they made their way into the Atlantic Ocean. They were bearing the tasks of sailors, just as men throughout history and men who will follow have done, plying the oceans in the search for advancement and national security. Man and machine. The crew and civilians aboard each had their assignments, their job responsibility. On the surface, the trail was familiar territory. They had mastered this before. But the ocean deep is an unforgiving mistress. Mistakes can cost you your life. But this was the last thing on their mind. Once again, they would begin the battery of tests that every submarine goes through. In open seas, they began shallow water test dives checking the ship in every way as they descended 50 to 100 feet at a time. This was done over the continental shelf, which does not exceed 600 feet in depth. The USS Skylark would escort from the surface, standing by with rescue capabilities for shallow depths. Skylark kept an open channel of communication to monitor their progress. The dives went well, and after this first day of testing, the Skylark was released. The two ships would steam all night and rendezvous 220 miles east of Cape Cod, well past the continental shelf, well past any immediate port of safe harbor. It was here that Thresher would undergo the test of her deep diving abilities. In the morning of April 10th, the deep diving test began. Everything was as it should be. The ship was responding well. The communications with Skylark were good. As the morning progressed, the Thresher would descend in small increments, level out, and run checks to ensure everything was working as intended. The procedure was performed repeatedly, 
as the Thresher continued to descend. Every 15 minutes, Skylark and Thresher would report to each other. Accounts vary, but sometime after 9.12 a.m., the Thresher indicated she was having difficulties. Have positive up angle, attempting to blow. But the Thresher was never to see the surface again. Topsides, the Skylog grew increasingly unsure. They attempted to contact the Thresher repeatedly. Do you have control? The Skylark skipper, Lieutenant Commander Hecker, voiced grabbing the mic from the radio men, finally resorting to dropping grenades, a special signal to tell the submarine to surface. Messages were sent to headquarters. They called it a loss of communication. The Skylark was still unsure. Soon came the planes. Ships embarked en route to a large search area east of Cape Cod. Their worst fears were soon to be realized. She was nearing test depth, as I understand it, and a four-inch silver braze pipe fitting in the auxiliary machinery space, which was just aft of the reactor compartment, failed. It left a four-inch stream of water that came in, and at the depth she was at, it essentially atomized as soon as it came in under the intense pressure. And what happened is it shorted out a lot of electrical stuff. One thing was the reactor compartment. It shut, the reactor plant shut down, so they lost propulsion power. And when that happened, they were essentially helpless. And the uh, seawater accumulated so fast, and it ran aft. So in my opinion, she took a down angle aft and went down vertically. And uh, when she reached over crush depth, the stern crushed in. I screened most all the photographs they took of the Thresher wreckage myself, and the stern section was crushed in. That would have let the water in. Then you had a water hammer, which then would have traveled right up the length of the hull to the bow, and it blew the bow right off. We have a picture of the bow just sitting there on the bottom, wide open. But they're still arguing. Uh, there was, I read some, an article uh, no more than a month ago about exactly, exactly what did let go initially. And there's some thought that, some thought that it was not, initially it was not a big, a, a big pipe that let go, but something in the exorbitant machinery space, as, 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 as Russ said, um, that sprayed water into the reactor control uh, mechanisms. And the doctrine at that time was that if you had a problem, uh, you shut the main steam stops coming out of the reactor plant to conserve as much heat in the reactor as you could to get it restarted because it, the reactor has to be at temperature and pressure before you can start nuclear operations. So when the main steam stopped shut, there was no way to get heat into the, into the main turbines. They changed that. Uh, they don't, doesn't, that doesn't happen automatically after a thresher. And the other thing that some have said critically is that on that trial, the thresher went down too fast. 
they made they didn't make enough intermediate stops. The practice I I remember the practice was you went down 100 feet at a time, or if, depending on what you had, maybe just 50 feet at a time. You diet you decrease your depth, uh, steady out at a depth, then everybody would check all the compartments and report back, and then you were satisfied, then you dip down another little bit until you got down. By going down rapidly like that, they may not have um, compensated for the density of the submarine adequately, because when you're operating normally, you like the submarine to be just a little bit light, if, if, if anything. So so that you would tend to, to rise up. But at those pressures, the hull does get smaller and denser, and uh, your practice should be to pump water out of your, your trim tanks to compensate for that. If they hadn't done that, uh, when they had the reactor scram and a whole lot of running around, and the boat was kept on sinking to the point where, you know. You would have been heavy and still a lighter nothing you could do about it so but we'll never know I don't think uh, they, they did have a sound recording mm -hmm. we had a uh, network of what a Celsius mm -hmm. where there were hydrophones all along the eastern seaboard and kind of swung across past Iceland so the threshers noises that it made when it was, being, when it was lost were recorded and I remember uh, Captain Harry Jackson probably knew more about submarine business mm -hmm. anyway in the, yeah. in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they were able to analyze the noises, and I think he was the one that uh, determined the exact pipe fitting that had failed. On April 10th, I was walking through the Shop 38 work area, taking a shortcut to my office. And I went by the supervisor's office and I saw one person in there, and I went in, and I says, Frankie Palmer, what are you doing here today? He says, I'm going on the Thresher Sea Trials. I said, good luck. He said, thank you. That night, on the 10th, about midnight or 1 o'clock, I got a call from Bill Poor, who was my boss, group supervisor, both 38 and 56. He says, we need you immediately in the shipyard. We have an emergency. So I went in the shipyard, and they told me that I would be a civilian casualty officer to go out and visit next to kin. And they said, if you wish to, you can take someone with you. So I called a fellow by the name of Franklin Stoney Jackson and woke him up. And he made a trip to go to Durham with me where we visit the next of kin, Mrs. Palmer. And it was located on Route 8 in, New in uh, Durham. And here it is, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, trying to find a house like that. And we talked on the way up, Stoney and I did. We probably have to end up in the police station. Well, as it was, we started going south on on uh, 108, and there was one house with lights on. So I went up to the door and knocked on the door. It was Mrs. Palmer. She was watching tea with a friend, TV with a friend. So she invited us in. We identified ourselves. And I told her I was there because they assumed, presumed that the Thresher had, had perished with the crew aboard, including her husband, frankly. She didn't seem to get through on her with that. And she said she knew her husband went on sea trials a lot. On occasion, they got fog bound and couldn't come in that day and would come in the next day. And this is what she thought. I said, no, Mrs. Palmer, the thresher has gone and Frankie has perished with the rest of them. And she sat down and she was in shock. Because the people that were left behind were co-workers of the people that went, you know, and it, it, so they had to feel that loss too. Mm. 
not just families, but co-workers and friends, lots of friends they left behind. And I think two of those people that, there were several that could have gone, should have gone, but for some reason or other they didn't go. And that must have been pretty hard for them to take. The Bathyscape Trieste was brought to Boston from San Diego and then towed to the search site by the USS Preserver. The Navy needed a vessel that could go to the tremendous depths where they thought the Thresher had sunk. The Trieste had once dived to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the deepest spot in the ocean. The Trieste was a large tank filled with gasoline, which is lighter than water, having a gondola underneath that would hold passage for two or three plus equipment. The Navy had searched by towing cameras on long lines. They hoped to find enough debris in the water for the Trieste to have a starting place for the search. The task of locating the Thresher would continue throughout the summer. Hampered by poor mobility and frequent trips back to Boston for repairs, combined with bad weather and rough seas, made progress slow and results negative. Fall was on its way with winter fast behind. Soon Mother Nature would force the operation to cease. At the end of August, they found Thresher at peace on the ocean's floor. We believe that these, our honored dead, have found within themselves a strength beyond the strength to live, a strength which is the strength for what we love to die. Let us then not think of these, our dead, save only in the light of Easter Day, for God with special love embraces those whose lives are lived in following him and serving fellow man. Truly in death our dear ones have found life. Truly in life our martyrs have found peace. The ocean's waters swell above our dead today, yet none of them so silently shall sleep. But angels' lips and ours may o'er them breathe. The Master's benediction, greater love than this no man can have that he lay down his life to save his fellow man. My brother-in-law was a very intelligent young man and he worked hard to get his um, engineering degree. He had his four children at the time that he was working to get his degree. So you can imagine trying to pay for school and support his family too. And then I think the irony of the thing that's had, really had to take is the fact that he only worked two years after working so hard. And he got the job on the yard and worked two years and then was gone. So, you know, that, it's just one of those things you think about. He was a good man. An intensive review of every aspect related to the design of a submarine. Think, what could you do to make it safer? The emergency bay ballast tank blow was one. Uh, eliminating large brazed pipe joints and replacing them with welded joints uh, was another. An emergency control system where you had a hydraulic accumulator, which the albacore has, just sitting there fully charged in case something happened to your uh, control system that you could use to operate your planes. Uh, I can still remember the 20 December 1963 letter that came out of NAV ships which itemized all the some safe items uh, that then became the full-fledged subsafe program. Subsafe program. 
that's when it started. At the pressure went down, the sub safe, more careful. It, it, you hate to say it, but the sub safe program, you lost pressure, but you might have saved lives later on. That on April 10th, 1963, there were 129 heroes because what the thresher meant to the submarine service after the fact was we have not lost any submarines since then. And we gained so much knowledge and experience in things to and not to do from the sinking of the thresher um, for future um, submarine, for the building of future submarine. That I look at it like that. Of course, we all miss him and everything, but he was a hero and he really made things a lot better. And all of the Thresher members were the founders of the SubSafe program still today that the Navy uses to keep the boats and the men safe. Uh, like he said, the submarine force has come a long way since then. Uh, with uh, pressure base putting on the memorial each year the way they do, uh, you know, uh, not forgotten, uh, which is very important, I think. Uh, I think a lot of the younger generations today, you know, you mentioned Cold, cold War, and uh, they, don't, they don't know what you're talking about.